about uh, nudity in the ancient world, but we don't need to talk about that anymore. We'll pass on that. If you weren't here for it, I'm sorry, you missed it. It was an exciting discussion. But um, we, we talked last week as well, remember, about the ancient pagan symbols that were used, well, they were the ancient Christian symbols that were used in pagan Rome and Greece before the time when Christianity was allowed. And both of the sarcophaguses that I showed you, sarcophaguses, I don't know. The plural for sarcophagus. Sarcophagi. Thank you. Uh, both the sarcophagi we looked at uh, had lots of symbols that, that the video I showed you was there to point out how they were meant to elude the Christianity within them. But the one symbol the ancient Christians could use easily was the symbol of Jonah. And uh, this is another one of those wonderful sarcophagi. And I have the date on this one. This one is from 270, I believe. So 270 CE. For those of you who know your Roman history, know that it's around 220, 221 when Constantine, somebody can correct me, right? Maybe it's 225. I get stuck on ones, but I think it could have been 225. Three, sorry, 325, when Constantine makes uh, Christianity legal in the Roman Empire. So this is well before that. And of course, there's lots of images here. One of the images here is from the Bible verse we heard this morning from the Gospel, the story of Lazarus. It's right here. And that would easily elude those who were looking for Christians and Christian burials because it looks very much like some sort of Egyptian mummy or something there. And it looks like uh, Marcus Aurelius here talking to the mummy. And these are the ways that they use these early Christian symbols uh, to be able to proclaim their Christianity without proclaiming it so easily that it was pointed out. You notice there are no crosses here, but most uh, folks who, are, who understand ancient Roman and art will point out that the fact that the tree is here is always a bit of a symbol of the tree that will be the wood of the cross. But the most important symbol here that takes up the majority of the sarcophagus, the side of the sarcophagus, is this image, which is exactly what we were talking about last week, which is the symbol of Jonah, right? Jonah being tossed off. Again, they could have put some clothes on him, could have had on some shorts or something, and thrown him into the water. This, of course, this doesn't look like a fish. It fits great with the idea of the sea monster image. What's that? Oh, what, that you need to have shorts? I know. We're not allowed to talk about naked. You can't be naked there, right? <laughs> naked, that's my bachelor's studies coming out. Um, well, oh, it could have been. There could have been some paint upon it. Thank you, Francis. Maybe he had on some nice red shorts. <laughs> but the point is, it's been a long weekend, God. I am. The, the image here is meant to be Jonah going into the beast. And Jonah being spewed out in beast. Uh, and so, of course, the, the deep meaning of that we talked about last week is, is what it is. It is a symbol of Jesus and the resurrection. It's the earliest story in which the early Christians went back to to understand what the, the, the ark of salvation we've been talking about from the Old Testament was trying to tell us about. And I use this really nice Coptic church um, image um, uh, act icons, what I'm trying to say, that really brings the Christian motif home with this. Because this one gives us an image of the fish spewing out Jonah. And Jonah himself is has the saintly uh, uh, halo on, but he looks a whole lot like the image that we normally see of Jesus. And the angel is here pointing to Jonah, and he's pointing to Jonah because here's an empty tomb, here are the crosses, uh, this is Nineveh, and these are the men that are there. I, it also, I, I didn't think about this, but this could very well be a connection, too, to the many stories in which we have Jesus on the boat when the storm comes, right? There's the famous story we've read in our Bible study on Mark in which Jesus, just like Jonah, is asleep, and the disciples come to wake him up to say, Lord, don't you, don't you want to help us out here? Can you get up? Can you get a bucket? Can you start getting the water out of the boat before it sinks? And Jesus, rather than having to get in the water, simply calms the sea with his, with his words, which, of course, scares the disciples out of their wits, even though they've been traveling with a guy healing people this whole time. 
to be able to control nature was a certain sign of divinity. Um, and then, of course, the other story that's most famous is, of course, Jesus. They leave Jesus. A storm comes. They look, and Jesus is walking on the water, right? And this could very well be Jonah, of course, but it also could remind us of Peter, who gets out and walks and begins to doubt and sinks into the water. So there's so many connections to the image and the, the message, the story of Jesus that comes to us from Jonah, and the early church picked up on it uh, and went with it and understood it to the point where, if you remember last week, we also talked about the, the ceiling and the, the wall behind the high altar of the Sistine Chapel. And, and what you may have never thought of or noticed before, but this, of course, is, is the uh, final judgment wall behind the high altar where the Pope goes and celebrates the Mass. And right above it, amongst all the prophets that are surrounding, we have prophets that are here, up here, all the way down the, the, the ceiling that Michelangelo painted. But the most important of the prophets is said right above Jesus, and this is Jonah, which we talked about last week. And Jonah, we know it's Jonah because it says Jonah's here, and also because there's a good uh, fish there ready to give the symbol of who Jonah is uh, in, the, in the message. And uh, this, this is what the whole excitement was last week was to discuss this and finally to point out that Jesus himself references Jonah in an important way in the Gospels, in Luke chapter 11. And last week I went straight to 20, verse 29, but I wanted to remind you this week where this passage 29 through 32 comes from. It comes from back in chapter, or in verse 16, when we find out that others, to test him, kept demanding from him a sign from heaven. When the crowds were increasing, he began to say, this generation is an evil generation. It asked for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. For just as Jonah became a sign to the people of Nineveh, so the Son of Man will be to this generation. The Queen of the South will rise at the judgment with the people of this generation and condemn them because she came from the ends of the earth to listen to the wisdom of Solomon and see something greater than Solomon is here. The people of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the proclamation of Jonah and see something greater than Jonah is here. And this is a masterful way, as we talked about last week, in which Jesus is able to combine so much of the Old Testament scripture into one passage that points in one direction, and that is directly at who he is as the Son of Man and what he's there to do. Um, I love how he ties the wisdom of Solomon and who is the Queen of the South? Anybody remember? The queen of Sheba, that's right. I love that. One of these days, maybe this Wednesday, if you come to the Lent series, um, I had a really wonderful experience amongst the Ethiopian Orthodox Chapel that sits on the, on the very roof of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. I, I really appreciate the Ethiopian church because they would not, they couldn't find the space in the main church. There's every part of the main church has a different denomination that controls it. There's the Catholic side, there's the Greek Orthodox who get a whole big chunk of it. There, even the Coptic Orthodox who are from Egypt have a little chapel on the back of, of the area where Jesus' resurrection occurred. But the poor Ethiopian Orthodox couldn't get in. So they said, we're just going to go sit on the roof and we'll build a little chapel on the roof. So they built the chapel on the roof. And of course, the idea of the Queen of Sheba, we can have a whole class on that. That's one of the spiritual uh, pilgrimages I'd like to make is to Ethiopia because they believe the Queen of Sheba came from Ethiopia and that that experience amongst Solomon led the Jewish faith into Ethiopia uh, when the Queen of Sheba went back. Um, they got a lot of other interesting stuff too. But Jesus is combining all of that here and to talk about how these people from outside the Jewish faith came and were given a message and they believed it and were changed by it. And this generation needs more than a message. They need a sign. And Jesus tells them the only sign they'll be given is the sign of Jonah. Which again, when I was growing up, even knowing the story of Jonah and the belly of the whale, I struggled with what in the world is the sign of Jonah. Well, the sign of Jonah, the early church knew for 2,000 years, three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, he comes out alive. That will be the great sign of Jonah that Jesus will deliver. So that was all of last week, again, in a nutshell. And, and, uh, and so I want to just stop.
and offer up a time for some questions. I have a couple more passages we've got plenty of time to talk about, but I want to make sure that if you have any questions about Jonah, you get a chance to ask them for once. I, I talk so much, don't have anything to ask. No. And yes? Um, I know lectionary is picked because of length sometimes, but I wonder why they didn't continue with the story in the lectionary with Jonah. Because his attitude never changed. Yeah, he seems he's a little grumpy the whole time, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I've always thought it's been the first recorded of Kudzu. Of what? Kudzu. Kudzu? Yeah, because he sat there and that body grew over and wanted to sit in there. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. See, yeah, Jonah was, uh, maybe that Jesus just wants to, and Jesus just wants to stop with the sign of Jonah. He doesn't want to be compared to the grumpy Jonah too much, apparently. So I imagine that's another reason. Even though he is willing to say that no matter what Jonah was like, he still goes to the... And that's the funny part, because he shifts from Jonah to the people of Nineveh. He never says that Jonah is the example you should look to. He says the people of Nineveh are who will stand up against the current generation. So you're right on the money. I mean, the sign that Jonah gives... Is, seems to be what's the most important part of the message to the early Christians and to the church. And I think that's why we don't get as much more from the story. Now, if you were in my Baptist uh, Sunday school class, you found out that he goes to Nineveh. But you don't get the Kudzu story, necessarily. It wasn't as exciting. But um, you find out that he goes. And the shocking part for dear old Jonah, and I, I, you know, there's so much we can learn from Jonah because we're all kind of like Jonah. We think we know what's going to happen. We don't need to go to that place. We know how they're going to be. We know how they're going to act. That's Jonah's piece from the whole part. I mean, he says that to God. He also is quite sure they're going to slay him right there when he walks in. He says this. But he goes in and finds out that the, they put on sackcloth. They get into a sense of repentance. And uh, it's a shock to him. It, it's not what he expects. And so much of the Christian message is contained within that. that they could add the whole story to the legend. I would be a supporter if I knew who to write to, Dan, I would write and say, put the whole story of Jonah in, because there's so much in that message that we need to hear. And it, it, it adds to, the last thing I'll say about Jonah and his crankiness is that uh, that's one of the beauties of our Christian faith, is it's very human. You know, it's very much like we are. I mean, Jesus himself, we've been proclaiming and, and we believe as Christians, did all of this stuff without sinning. But he got awful close quite often. He got a little cranky himself sometimes. He had to run the people out of the out of the temple, the money changers out of the temple. He, he gets a little grumpy with people who grab his cloak when he's trying to get from one place to the other. I mean, we don't have to get into the, the discussion about sinfulness, but the humanness is what we look for. And the, the beauty of people like Jonah, like Peter, who's always making a mess and forgetting what, who he's with, and the disciples in general are a disaster most of the time. And that's really helpful to those of us in the church, because we're very human, and, and our faith believes in humanness. I mean, and, and it's all built right into the Nicene Creed when we say fully, fully human, fully divine. I mean, if he was just floating around like Superman, it would be very hard for us to, I mean, to keep going after he was gone. Um, but the, the humanness, the, the idea of our physical nature being tied into divinity and the struggles with that, I think is, is what keeps our faith focused on, on hope. Yes, Francis. Who does what? The Queen of Sheba, yeah. No camels, no bellies of camels. That's the sign. That and Jesus is also using someone very near and dear to the Jewish heart. Because these are Pharisees and these are people who are coming to him. And he's also using Solomon as much as he's using the Queen of Sheba. Just as he's using Nineveh in, in more ways than he is Jonah really. But he's using Solomon to say, 
she came all the way from this far distant land to listen to the wisdom of Solomon. And then he says, you have something greater than Solomon. Uh, and, and that's his point. Is that if, if they, and so you're right, there's no belly of the whale, there's no three days, three nights. The sign of Jonah is what is the three days and the three nights. And then it's the shift to the people from outside the Jewish community who are recognizing uh, God's wisdom. I mean, the wisdom of Solomon, Nineveh repenting at the words of Jonah. He would expect more from the very people who get to stand in the presence of, of, of Messiah and from the time of Jesus. Any other Jonah in the belly of the fish spewing him out? I could have put the picture back up in which he's being spewed out. <laughs> More of the spewing. All right, well, let, let's move on then beyond Jonah. The other passages that I wanted to get us to last week finally bring us from the Old Testament into the New Testament, which is uh, passages that still have as much deep meaning as, uh, and give us more direct information about that ark of salvation we've been talking about. But it's important, I think, to understand all of the deep and, and deep connections the Old Testament has. Because Jesus himself, even though he'll give us a whole new set, a whole new message for us to listen to, just as we just read in that passage from Luke, never goes too far from the Old Testament references to try and say everything that you've known was what God intended for you to know. You just needed to get from the surface level a bit deeper down into the message, and then you would recognize that all of these things I'm revealing to you, God has been pointing you to from the beginning. Um, the one, the two verses that I picked out for to go along with the Jonah lesson, and I can't remember why I chose the English Standard Version. I must have liked it better when I was putting this class together um, and going through the verses in the past. But the first one is the very beginning of the, the story of Jesus uh, in, in the Gospel of Mark. There are only 14 passages, 14 verses before this in chapter 1, and they involve what in Mark's Gospel? And if you're in my Bible study, don't say it. I mean, only 14 passages before we get to the message of Jesus coming forth. Anybody remember? It's his baptism. Jesus' baptism is where we start. And that has led many people to, many scholars to feel like Mark is the oldest gospel. Why is that? Because it lacks and misses all the other stories we know about. How does Matthew and Luke begin? The, the story of Jesus begin in Matthew and Luke. It begins with his birth. We have the, the Christmas stories, the Luke one, and it's the Christmas story because that's the one Charlie Brown uses, and I believe what Charlie Brown says. That's how the story should go. And, and then, yeah, and then you've got the Matthew story, which begins with the genealogy of Jesus, a little bit more info, and focuses a bit more on Joseph and his issues uh, when he finds out the woman he's about to marry is already raped with a child. Um, but that's how Matthew and Luke begin. And many of what Matthew and Luke have in them, Mark has within them as well. Uh, but Mark is a lot less, a little more sparse in so many ways. And that leads most scholars to sort of think, well, this must be our first image of, of a gospel because they, they go straight to the source where Jesus begins to speak. Because, of course, in the story of Jesus' birth, Jesus isn't saying anything. He's a child. We only have really any uh, reference to Jesus saying anything um, and one story of his youth. What is that? I remember in Luke's gospel. He's back talking his parents. That's exactly right, Francis. <laughs> Do not know it be about my father's business. And Joseph's like, you weren't, you weren't working and doing any carpentry work today, son. Um, but no, he's in the he's in the uh, temple, teaching, speaking, and, and and amazing the doctors there, meaning the the, the brilliant minds and, and the rabbis and the and the teachers, uh, and that's the only reference we have. So in Mark's Gospel, we begin with the sign of Jesus uh, being baptized and beginning his ministry. And so Mark, verse chapter 1, verse 14 through 15, simply says, Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. 
And why I think all of us Christians should know this, simple, short, two verses of Mark's Gospel, is because it gives us the message of what Jesus is there to do. He's there to proclaim the Gospel of God. And of course, all of us Christians know what Gospel means, the good news of God. And what is the good news of God? The time is fulfilled. Well, what is the time? What, what, what is the time that's being fulfilled? I mean, for the Jewish mind, it includes what? The coming of the Messiah. Yeah, it, it, it includes the coming of the Messiah, but Jesus is speaking beyond that, I think. That great arc of salvation is leading to some sort of deliverance from what happened at creation. Remember, because this is, this is God makes the world and says it's good. In seven days, he creates the garden, he creates Adam and Eve, that whole story. I mean, again, we as Episcopalians read it and see all the meanings within it. God does all of this with the intention of making it good. And the story of the fall is where sin enters in. And with sin, the thing that I talked about way too much over the last three days, death and dying. Because we had a, a safety class here on Thursday night. I had to wake up to the sound of a tornado sirens. Thank you guys for not telling me as much about that. <laughs> three months, five tornado warnings. Anyway, and then we had a death and dying class yesterday in which we delved deeply into the sense of death. The time that is being fulfilled is God is finally beginning in the bringing of His kingdom, which is a restoration of what He created in the beginning. I mean, God's intention always is for the world to be good, His creation to be good. He makes us in His own image. He intends for us to live just in, in, in the image of God. So this is what that time fulfilled is. Yes, all of those who are surrounded by Him would instantly think, Ah, David has come back. The Messiah is here. We know what He's going to do. He's going to run these stinking Romans out of here, and we're going to get ourselves back to the way it should be here in our place. Jesus, of course, is always going well beyond what we think He's here to do. And I think when He says the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, He's going all the way back to the beginning. And of course, that's the other gospel we didn't talk about when we talked about Matthew, Mark, and Luke. That is the, the final, the fourth gospel, the gospel of John. Where does the, if we said that the gospel of Mark begins with baptism, which is right here, and Jesus suddenly proclaiming his message, and we said that Matthew and Luke begin at Jesus' birth, maybe even a little before his birth, because we hear about the story of the Annunciation and uh, of, of, of uh, Zechariah and, um, and well, not Anna, but um, come on, help me out here. Elizabeth, thank you, and the birth of John the Baptist. So we get a little bit of that. Actually, that's where Luke begins. There's a lot of good names, and uh, uh, Joachim and Anna is the name of who? From tradition, not from the Bible. Mary's mother and father, but we don't get that story in, in, the, in the Bible that comes from a different text that is not in the Bible. Where does John's Gospel begin? In the beginning. And in the beginning is creation. And you should know that because we've been talking about that, right? That was all the... Uh, Audrey loves it when I talk about Yahweh, breath. Yahweh. And, and the sense of breathing out the Word. We talked all about that when we were dealing with Trinity. All the way back in the book of Genesis, which is, is hard to believe, but is, I believe as a Christian, is right there for us to read. John's Gospel brings it together. Um, so it's, it's not surprising that Jesus begins with something that goes well beyond David and Rome and invasion and uh, all the things that Messiah had come to mean in the minds of, of Jewish people. Uh, and he begins to speak about time fulfilled and the kingdom of God being at hand. And then he throws in two last things, repent, and believe in the gospel. And I think we've talked about this, I didn't talk about this in the past, I know I've preached a sermon on it. The sense of repent brings about the image of the, the guy standing on the sidewalk downtown yelling at us to repent, <laughs> or you're going to hell, right? But repentance has a much more deeper meaning to it, which means give up your own agenda, give up to what you think, give up, give up this idea of Messiah as you see it, and be changed, be transformed, and believe in the good news. That's why repent and believe are so important in this passage. And it is that repentance comes along with belief, and belief comes from good news. I mean, 
the, the gospel, the good news of Jesus, the sense that the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand, tell us what Jesus came to preach and proclaim. Because those are the two pieces of Jesus' life. The message that he gives to us, which we talk about every Sunday, and the amazing events that are going to occur starting next week when we get to Palm Sunday and we walk our way through Holy Week and we arrive at the crucifixion, which is absolutely essential to get to resurrection, which is Easter Sunday morning. Um, I like to have a little bit of artwork somewhere. It's the best I could come up with for that one is Jesus' teaching, right? Um, I, I, we have more of a sense of him standing and walking around like those guys on the side of the road. But if you know the rabbi tradition, it is the teacher is seated and those who gather around listen to him. I think more this, this is a, a good image of, of Jesus, the teacher, and the preacher. Um, that's it. Mark 1, verses 14 through 15. All of us as Christians should have a sense of what Jesus comes to proclaim. That the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the good news uh, that he's bringing. So, the, the last verse that I wanted to go with in connection with Jonah and the message of Jesus, which ties into this message we hear in Mark of what he's there to preach and proclaim to the people, not just those people, but the people even beyond the Jewish community, is, of course, this set of readings. Sometimes it goes double and it works just perfectly. And that is... Uh, all of us Christians need to know in a deeper way than just football games. Uh, and there was a great sermon preached on just, just a couple of Sundays ago by Jeannie. And that is Jesus in chapter 3 of John's Gospel, verses 11 through 17. Notice I didn't just say you need to know John 3, 16. You need to understand what's around it, what Jesus is doing. This is a wonderful story. Every one of these Lenten Sundays I've been disappointed I didn't get to preach at because there's so much richness in the stories. Um, this one in particular that Jeannie preached on uh, about Nicodemus. I love the story of Nicodemus. Nicodemus is a Pharisee. He comes to Jesus by night because he doesn't want to be seen. Also, the image of by night is meant to show that he is not in the light. He doesn't understand. I mean, there's so much richness to John's Gospel. And Nic but Nicodemus wants to see the light. And Jesus would tell him that multiple times in this passage, in these passages from John chapter 3, in which you get to hear the, the discussion of, of Nicodemus and Jesus. But in the midst of that discussion, uh, Jesus will say, you must be born again. It's every Baptist needs to know these passages too, because being born again is the message we hear. And, of course, Nicodemus says, how can you be born again? you got to go back in the womb or something? And Jesus says, no, you have to be born by water and the Spirit. This will lead into loads of discussions about images of baptism uh, and all of that. But when we finally get to verse 11, Jesus is moving on to a, another piece of the story. And to me, this captures well the sign of Jonah that we read, uh, we heard about and talked about last week in the beginning of this week. Jesus said, very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. So, all of us need to have a grasp of the, of the deepness of this passage, because within it, we have what we've been talking about for the last four weeks. Jesus is speaking about things that have already occurred, things that he says that we know, meaning as, 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 as Jews at the time of Jesus, they knew those stories from the Old Testament. They read them a thousand times, and yet Jesus is delivering them in this new way, this understanding way. Think of Jesus saying the sign of Jonah. He's teaching them that there's something deeper to that ark of salvation than just the law 
which is, of course, what is at the heart of Judaism, following the laws that are given. And Jesus goes as far as is connecting it all to Moses here, too. He says, if, if, I'm, if I'm talking to you about earthly things and you don't believe, how can you believe in the heavenly things? Then he says, no one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven. Uh, you know, this is his image of the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, this goes back to a story that if I'd been better prepared, I would have had a, a chart here to tell you about. But the, the image of, G, of Moses lifting up the serpent, the most important part of that is the image of Jesus himself as he says the Son of Man must be lifted up. And that lifting up, of course, is the image Jesus will use of being lifted up on the cross completely different from everything that the people of, of Israel and Jerusalem and all of the surrounding community had been reading and understanding the New Testament to say. But Jesus is there to give them the deeper message and the deeper meaning. And he's pointing to this image of him being lifted up and he'll say this again in the Synoptic Gospels, lifted up so that everyone can see him. And he's being lifted up on the cross. And why is he doing that? In order that those who believe may have eternal life. And that leads us to John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son so that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. That's the way Jesus actually said it in the King James Version of the Bible. Um, but that's it. The, the image of what God is doing here. How is God going to tell us that the time is fulfilled? He's going to do it through this image of Jesus who's going to be lifted up to be seen so that everyone who can believe in him will not perish, but have the same thing Jesus would show us in the story we're going to hear in two Sundays, which is the story of the resurrection. And then we throw in chapter, or verse 17, because it's important to say this. Indeed, God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world. Remember that first verse from Mark, we said, repent and believe. And repent always seems to come with judgment. Repent always seems to come with condemnation. But God wants us to understand that Jesus is sent out of love and it's not to condemn the world, but it's in order that the whole world might be saved through him, which is the ultimate sign of God's love for all of God's creation. Um, I couldn't help but dig in. I typed in, what would be the image you get from John 3.16? And of course I got the passage as it lands to us in the King James Version of the Bible, which is the way probably the majority of us learned it, even if we were raised church. And uh, finally, the only other image that kind of struck me was this nice image of the cross. Um, I, I wish I could give the artist some acknowledgement, but whoever puts it together, it's a nice image. And it's based around uh, the, the story, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, are the words there from the cross and back. So to me, the story of Jonah, that message we hear from Mark, this important set of verses from John chapter 3 are all to give us the, the complete story of what Jesus is here to do. The, the, all the connections from, from Jesus, have the, the image of his coming death on the cross and resurrection, the sign of Jonah, the message that Jesus has come to proclaim and the time being fulfilled and the good news of the gospel and what comes out of that good news, what comes out of the whole thing, which is the offer of eternal life not just to a certain group of people, but to the entire world, because God wants to save it, and God loves it. And this, to me, is important for all of us as Christians. Strong connections. So, um, any questions for that? Yes. We were talking about the second hour, we Yes, everybody can have my hand out. I don't want to give my hand I keep saying to people, I'm not giving it to it's all over. So, yes, you will. All of that will be given to you, as Jesus would say. That was too much. I apologize. Uh, but, but, yes, the, 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 the handout will, will come out. I'm holding it, too, because I'm adding extra verses. Next time I do this class, it'll be the 25 passages of Scripture that everybody needs. And at the end of my ministry, it'll probably be 50 or something. As I said, it's hard to limit it because there's so much. And they're all so interconnected. And, you know, I had a wonderful professor one time tell me when I was in in undergrad school that, you know, education isn't about learning everything about one topic. It's about being able to find all the connecting links to everything else. 
And so I've, I've held on to that that she gave me. And I really think that's what gives us this deep Bible message. It's not just reading the history, but reading where the links are and how they connect. I've got Jim Lee. Yes. Well, I, this might take too much time. I've always been very interested in the serpent. Yeah. Sunday of the year. So let's let's see how much time we have. In. 